Our next session is Interprofessional Intensive Comprehensive Aphasia Program Outcomes and Insights. It features two more clinical two more clinical experts from our speech language hearing and sciences program. Dr. Elizabeth Hoover, Hoover is a clinical associate professor and clinical director of the Aphasia Resource Center at Boston University. She holds board certification in adult neurogenic communication disorders. Anne Carney is a lecturer in the Department of Speech Language and Hearing Sciences and has been instrumental in each phase of the interprofessional intensive aphasia program. Welcome Dr. Hoover and Ms. Carney. Hello and welcome. We're excited to share with you um, outcomes and insights from a program that was developed here at Sargent College about five years ago to meet the needs of our patients with aphasia. Aphasia, as you know, is a language disorder that's caused by injury to the language centers of the brain. So intensive aphasia programs have been growing in popularity in the last 20 years or so. However, the majority of the growth has been recent. Indeed, the number of programs in operation in the United States has doubled in the past four years. It's estimated that there are now about 14 programs in operation throughout the United States. So what exactly is an intensive comprehensive aphasia program, or ICAPS as they're called? Well, it's a program that's intensive, which offers more than 20 hours of treatment um, over the week. It's completed by a cohort of participants who begin and end the program at the same time. It addresses both individual and group treatment throughout the program, and it also includes family education. Evidence in support of these programs is still in its infancy. However, recent and encouraging results are showing improvements in specific language functions, as well as communication in general and quality of life as a result of these kinds of programs. I'd like to take a few moments now to talk with you about the program we developed here at Sargent College. In 2011, we were charged with developing a program here, and when we considered the needs of individuals with stroke-induced aphasia, we recognized that these folks often have motor and sensory issues, cognitive issues, visual issue, issues, as well as cardiac, weight loss, and or cholesterol issues. So we decided to capitalize on the interprofessional culture that we have here at Sargent College and develop a program that was interprofessional in nature. So our program included the expertise of our nutrition, our nutrition therapists, our occupational therapists, physical therapists, and speech language pathologists here at Boston University. Our program has been running now in an experimental design fashion for four years. So we'll present data for you um, that covers the, the last four years of the program. We've enrolled 27 participants in total with a mean age of 56.3 years, a mean level of education of 15.9 years, and a mean time post onset of, of uh, 4.9 years. I'm going to turn you over to my colleague Ann Carney now to discuss more details of the program. Thank you, Liz. As Liz discussed, what made the BU ICAP unique was its interprofessional nature. Participants received occupational therapy, physical therapy, nutrition treatment, and speech and language therapy. The participants re received intensive treatment for six hours a day, five days a week, across four weeks. We offered individualized impairment-based speech and language treatments, as well as individual and socially oriented group, OT, PT, nutrition treatments. Explicit training of goals across context was another unique aspect of our program. For example, we trained from individual treatment to group treatment, across disciplines, and most importantly, out into the community. Here's a sample schedule for week one of the program. The schedule differed slightly year to year based on the availability of students and faculty. Students were an integral part of the treatment team across disciplines. The schedule also varied based on the scheduling of interprofessional outings and co-treatments. As you'll see, speech and language therapy is represented in purple and represents the bulk of the treatment hours. 
nutrition is represented in green across the lunch hour, and occupational therapy abuts nutrition, this scheduling allowed for regular co-treatments so that participants could implement strategies and use adaptive equipment for preparing and eating healthy meals. Physical therapy is represented in blue and took place across three days. In our recruitment, we specifically looked for participants who had community-oriented goals that could be supported by all disciplines. For example, increasing meal preparation and shopping skills, increasing participation in leisure activities, increasing volunteerism, or returning to paid work. Here is an example of a participant whose goal was to increase his independence for dining out. From the PT perspective, he worked on gait, balance, and endurance training. He also practiced accessing the public transportation system in Boston. In, that included boarding and deboarding the Boston T, which happens to run outside of our college. From the PT perspective, public transportation schedules and neighborhood restaurants were researched, and he also practiced using adaptive utensils for eating. From the nutrition perspective, menus were previewed, healthy substitutions were discussed, and in general, we had to modify some of the participants' diets to support the increased activity of this intensive program. From the speech and language perspective, we targeted relevant vocabulary through naming treatments, prepared scripts for ordering out, and also did role plays in group treatments. I'll now go into a bit more detail about the speech and language program. Speech and language treatment was provided in individual sessions, dyadic sessions, and groups, and comprised approximately 15 to 16 hours of the treatment time each week. The group treatments that we offered were modeled after existing groups at the Boston University Aphasia Resource Center and were selected based on the individual goals and interests of the program participants. Some of our core groups included an iPad Skype group, whereby participants were introduced to the iPad, as well as both Skype and FaceTime for new users, a Toastmasters group, which is a speech-making group, a book club, a newsletter group, and a current events group. We also had a Constant Therapy iPad group to introduce our participants to this new app developed by Dr. Swathi Kiran's lab to support their home programming. Another unique aspect of our program was the integration of the iPad. All participants were given an iPad if they didn't already own one. We started by surveying the group members to assess their current usage, familiarity, and interest in various apps. Anytime we introduced an app, we accompanied it with step-by-step -step instructions that included screenshots. We re reviewed key accessibility features such as text-to-speak, and we provided multiple opportunities for practice within individual treatment sessions, group sessions, and in home practice as well. Here are some sample apps that we introduced to support functional communication, areas of interest, and activities of daily living. We also introduced apps designed specifically for the rehabilitation of speech and language, and when indicated, we individualized apps to support AAC needs, so apps such as Pictello and ProLoco to Go, which you may know uh, involve uh, speech output. Here is an example of some handouts that we prepared to accompany our uh, session on introducing email on the iPad. In addition to individual and group treatment, we provided dyadic treatment modeled after the constraint-induced language treatment work of Pulvermuller and colleagues. As you may know, constraint-induced language treatment was inspired by the constraint-induced movement therapy work of our physical therapy colleagues. In addition to the CILT exchanges, pairs engaged in a pace exchange using written and semantic feature scaffolds as needed. Each week, we rotated the stimulus based on the client's interests and goal areas. The stimulus included occupations relevant to the participants, personal hobbies, geographical locations of interest, as well as preferred foods and the healthy foods that were being emphasized during nutrition sessions. I'm going to turn it back over to Liz now to discuss the program's outcomes. Thank you, Anne. So let me talk you through the speech and language data that we collected. We had uh, 
a group of measures together, six of which were administered one month pre-treatment, immediately pre-treatment, immediately post-treatment, and then at three months post-follow-up. The language and communication measures we chose were sensitive to discrete functions of, of communication um, and also assessed quality of life and, um, and, and stigma associated with aphasia. Our data were analyzed using an ANOVA on repeated measures to determine whether performance changed for the group over time. If a statistical significant change was observed, we then went in and calculated um, the location of the difference using a paired t-test statistic. We looked at intervals specifically between treatment or prior to treatment, excuse me, from pre to post treatment and then uh, following treatment. This graph here illustrates performance for the group on tests of naming. The, um, the blue line here indicates noun naming, and the red line indicates naming of verbs. The table to the right indicates the test statistics from the t-test the between each of the baseline intervals. Our data here show a statistical change in scores only from pre to post treatment, indicating a statistically significant treatment effect. We see the same trend, or same pattern here, on alphabetical word naming, in which the individual with aphasia is asked to name as many items as they can that begin with the letters F, A, and S, respectively. The psycholinguistic assessment of language Analy or excuse me, assessed um, measures of repetition of real words and non-words, the ability to produce sentence, and the ability to produce morphemes in affixed words. Our data here, again, shows statistically significant changes only from pre to post treatment, indicating that our group as a whole showed improvements on these specific measures of language. The discourse comprehension test measures the ability to comprehend a discourse which includes inferenced and, uh, and explicit main ideas and details. We see the same pattern of improvement here from pre to post treatment. The graph indicates a slight degradation in performance following treatment, however this wasn't at a level of statistical significance and therefore the treatment effect for the group was maintained. Narrative analyses were analyzed for the total number of words, as well as the percentage of words which carry correct information. Both of these parameters for the group showed, again, a statistically significant change from pre to post treatment. Our final measures were concerned with quality of life and communication in the environment. The ASHA facts, shown here in red, is a seven-point Likert scale, which is used to measure the communicative success of the individual with aphasia in the environment. We asked the spouse or close family member of the individual with aphasia to complete this measure to allow us to capture changes that were perceived by the family. The stroke impact scale, shown here in blue, was completed by the participant and rates levels of stigma and quality of life associated with aphasia. Both parameters here showed a statistically significant change from pre to post treatment. So our data from this program showed promising results on these formal measures of communication and quality of life. But what happened to the patients once this program was terminated? Well, most of our participants who lived locally were, were re-enrolled in our weekly groups at the Aphasia Center. Others enrolled in ongoing research studies through uh, Professor Kieran's lab. Some have become volunteer guests in our academic programs in the college. Others have returned to volunteer or work experiences. So in summary, this program shows significant changes on linguistic measures, functional communication, and quality of life measures, and Im as importantly, if not more so, real changes in return to participation in the community. 
These programs are complex and costly, so more research is needed to better understand which of the critical components in the program were influential in the change that we experienced. So there's a call for more research and we hope to keep the dialogue moving. In closing, I would like to thank the many gifted researchers and clinicians involved in this program, and I'd like to extend a heartfelt thank you to Mr. Stephen Weber, who originally approached me in 2011 about starting this program and provided the initial funds to, to get the program going. Thank you.